Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox. I'm the Compliance Evangelist, and I'd like to welcome you to episode 406 of the FCPA Compliance Report. Today, I have back with me James Kukios. James is a partner in Morrison and Forrester, and he's here to talk about the firm's August International Anti-Corruption Newsletter. Some of the highlights of the podcast include how the newsletter is produced, the declination with disgorgement received by the insurance company of Barbados, the three declinations discussed in the newsletter and what they might mean for the compliance professional, the case that keeps on giving and going on, Petavesa, the 1MDB prosecutions, the Hoskins decision, what it means for the compliance practitioner, and incentives the Department of Justice has given to companies to come in and self-disclose. As always, James provides a great wrap-up of the firm's newsletter and lots of practical advice for the compliance professional and compliance practitioner going forward. The FCPA Compliance Report is a part of the Compliance Podcast Network. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, back for another episode, and I'm always pleased to have with me back James Kukios. James is a fellow U of M grad, so go blue. He'd finally be at Michigan State, uh, and he's here to talk about the August Morrison and Forrester uh, Top 10 International Anti-Corruption Development a newsletter that he and several of his colleagues from the law firm put out. So, James, first of all, uh, welcome and thank you for taking the time to visit with me. Thanks, Tom. Go Blue. When I was growing up, we would beat Michigan State 75 percent of the time. Uh, unfortunately, the last 10 years has been a little bit of a walk in the wilderness. So let's hope this gets back to status quo. Amen. In the natural Amen. order. In the natural <laughs> order. <laughs> I'm big on the natural order of things. So if you're a Michigan State fan listening to this, sorry. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> the uh, James, as always, there's a lot going on in the individual newsletters. And I'm wondering uh, if you might just uh, give a few words about how you guys produce it, what you decide to highlight, uh, who's involved from the firm's perspective, and walk us through the creation of it each month. Sure. Thanks, Tom. Happy to do it. So this is a newsletter we we put out every month, um, top 10 international anti-corruption developments for each month of the year. Uh, As a firm, we've been putting this out since sometime in 2014, which is before I got here when when Chuck DeRoss left the FCPA unit and came to Morris and Forrester. And when I uh, came to MOFA, I really kind of took it over for for a while. And, you know, what we we tried to do, and what I really tried to do was look at um, global anti-corruption developments. And so that's number one. We try to look at more than just U.S. enforcement actions. Now, DOJ and SEC have been very busy over the last couple of years, and so um, we do tend to focus a lot on DOJ and SEC enforcement actions. But we do try to look at it globally, take a look at corruption trends, uh, new legislation in countries that may be uh, affect um, businesses and individuals doing business uh, in major economies. Um, we like to look at, for example, the OECD reports on how various other countries are doing in terms of their anti-corruption enforcement and try to take a, a big picture look at global anti-corruption enforcement and trends around the world. Uh, when I first got here to MoFo, I was doing this largely by myself, um, which was a really great um, experience for me because I got to think um, both on uh, my old law enforcement hat, what would have been interesting to me and how would I have analyzed these things? And then also start to think about, well, and why would these be uh, important to our clients and potential clients as well? So it was a very nice transition for me. As time went on and I got fortunately busier uh, with with actual paying work, um, but I also started to realize, you know, um, this would be a good thing for our associates to work on as well because, We wanted them to start thinking about issues the same way that enforcement authorities and businesses look at things. So what we do now is every month we have a team of two or three associates go through some various news um, aggregators that we have here at the firm and identify a number of potentially interesting um, topics. They then run them by me and I give them a thumbs up or a thumbs down. They draft it. And then I get a final edit of those uh, of their draft. And we try to put it out towards the beginning of the, of the month 
uh, first half of the month. Um, so it's as topical as possible. Sometimes that gets prevented because of work, but really overall, the idea here is we want to summarize in one very succinct place, a lot of information about global anti-corruption corruption enforcement and trends that are going to be useful to compliance officers and in-house counsel. So they don't have to read everything every day. So they don't have to read every article out there. But what the other thing that we do in there is we include hyperlinks to the actual articles or the actual enforcement decisions or the actual laws so that people, if they do want to go a little bit deeper, they can read our summary, which hopefully has some very good and efficient insight, but they can go a little deeper as well, click through those links and read a little bit more of the primary documents and things like that. And being a lawyer, of course, I want to read all the primary documents. So I really appreciate that part, James. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's it's fun and it's good. Um, you know, it's good to have that in there for posterity too. If you ever want to go back and cite something or give your authority for something, it's really helpful. Well, James, one of the things that uh, really jumped out at me on this newsletter was uh, a fair number of uh, declinations with disgorgement were granted by the Department of Justice and uh, looked like uh, most of them were for non-U.S. companies. So I was wondering if you just might sort of detail those. And, and then really, I wanted to ask, is there anything, uh, any one theme that you see or is there anything that the compliance practitioner should take away from this series of declarations? Declinations with disgorgement. Yeah, I think there was only one actual declination with disgorgement, Tom. And I think, but I think that actually uh, raises a very interesting point because there was another declination under the FCPA corporate enforcement policy that highlights something different that we haven't seen before. So maybe we'll start with the declination with disgorgement. Uh, that involved a Barbados-based insurance company. Uh, that, according to the DOJ declination with disgorgement letter. DOJ determined that in August 2015 and April 2016, the company had paid about $36,000 in bribes to a member of parliament who was also the country's uh, minister of industry, international business, commerce, and small business development in exchange for his assistance in obtaining two government contracts. Uh, the interesting th thing there is that the, the minister was also a U.S. resident and arranged to receive the bribe payments in the United States. You know, that's been uh, a very frequent um, way for DOJ to gather evidence. Um, I did the, for example, the Haiti Teleco uh, prosecutions, and a lot of the folks who live in the Caribbean and certain parts of Latin America live and bank in the United States. So that's often a very fertile way to both get jurisdiction over people, but also to get evidence of cases. So this one is is a little bit more, I'll call it traditional. They've only declinations with disgorgements have only exa existed for about two years now. But this is a little bit more of a traditional declination with disgorgement. There's a letter from DOJ that says we found that you did the following things, but we're not going to um, pursue a more formal enforcement action against you. But we do want you to cough up the uh, uh, proceeds of the alleged wrongdoing. In which case, this was uh, 93 just over $93,000, almost $94,000. So we've seen a lot of those um, since the FCPA pilot program created that remedy. And we don't really consider those to be true declinations. Uh, we actually consider them a fourth type of enforcement action in addition to a guilty plea, DPA, NPA. And we actually consider a declination with disgorgement an, an actual enforcement action uh, because money is paid and, and there's a finding of, of wrongdoing. Um, but the really interesting one I found was the next one, which is the – I don't know how to say this, so please forgive me, but I think it's Guralp Systems Limited. Uh, and in that one, DOJ wrote a letter that was public, and they cited the FCPA corporate enforcement policy, but they did not require the company to disgorge any profits. And so that's kind of a new twist that we've seen the, with all of the – declinations so far, public declinations under the pilot program or the enforcement policy, we've seen them all with disgorgements. In this one, DOJ said no disgorgement. And they cited a number of reasons for that. But I think the two primary ones to me are, number one, DOJ cited the company's assistance in the prosecution of a Korean official 
who was allegedly the recipient of the bribes. And of course, he was tried last summer by the FCPA unit and the U.S. Attorney's Office uh, in Los Angeles and convicted on money laundering charges. But also, and I think this may be more significant, uh, and I, so I'll quote it, it's uh, DOJ cited the company's, uh, the fact that the company, quote, is the subject of an ongoing parallel investigation by the UK's serious fraud office for violations of law relating to the same conduct and is committed to accepting responsibility for that conduct with the SFO. Now, what I think that sounds like is there may be an agreement in principle or a likely agreement uh, between the company and the SFO where there will be some kind of monetary penalty or disgorgement type of resolution. And so what DOJ is really saying is, in effect, there is a declination with disgorgement, but they're crediting that disgorgement uh, and so not even asking for it in the first place. So I think it's a very interesting um, development. It's a it's a twist on the declinations we've seen, public declinations that we've seen. And it also seems to coincide with the uh, piling on policy where, uh, of course, the, the FCPA unit for a long time has been trying to make sure that co- companies that cooperate and things like that don't get penalized twice. Uh, but then we have the formal piling on policy. And this seems to be both a intersection of the corporate enforcement policy and the piling on policy where there's actually a full declination uh, in uh, uh, in respect of another country's uh, potential enforcement action. So I think that's a really the contrast between the Barbados insurance case and the Gurulp systems case, uh, the resolutions there is very interesting and it's a new wrinkle in enforcement. You know, I guess, James, it seemed to me to be almost a logical ex- extension of what I used to call the one pie policy, and now it's called the anti-piling on policy. And and um, it just seemed to me to be really just a logical extension from that. Totally agree. The, the interesting thing about it is these things have happened in the past, but they haven't been public declinations. So that's very interesting now that DOJ felt comfortable making this declination public, citing the FCPA corporate enforcement policy, but not actually requiring any money to be paid up front. So I just I found that to be very interesting because these kinds of declinations have happened in the past, but they've been non-public. And one of the reasons why the declinations with disgorgement have to be public is, is because there's money changing hands and there has to be transparency with the public. So it's just very very interesting. I totally agree with you in, in theory, but I think the fact that there was something publicly done is a is a new twist. Hmm. Okay. And then there are, of course, a, a number of other declinations that uh, publicly traded companies announced. These were not made public by the enforcement agencies, um, but there was a, a number of companies, uh, uh, Hertz Rental Car Corporation, uh, the Brazil-based electric- electricity company, uh, Electrobras, and then a China-based biopharmaceutical company, Sinovac Biotech, all announced in various securities filings, press releases, or other market announcements that the agencies had, uh, at least one of the agencies, and in some cases both, had declined to move forward on the on their FCPA investigations with them. Those are more traditional um, the agencies didn't make those public. The publicly traded companies did in these kind of market announcements. And, you know, um, the fact they happened over August, this is a completely non-scientific statement. Uh, and I don't have any data to back this up, but having been there, I, I kind of understand it. Oftentimes you'll see a lot of declinations happen over the summer. It tends to be a, a quieter time in DC. And a lot of times, Prosecutors can kind of focus on some of their housekeeping duties uh, and enforcement attorneys from SEC. And oftentimes, the summer is a great time to kind of go back to those files that you have, dust them off a little bit, make sure that you've crossed your T's, dotted your I's. And if you think you can decline them, it's a good time to get that paperwork in. We also see in September, SEC trying to clean up a lot of cases because of the end of their fiscal year as well. But I don't think that there's any trend necessarily that we see in these three more traditional declinations other than my own personal gut feeling about um, summer housekeeping. 
So if I could go back to the um, Barbados Insurer and uh, Goolrap, uh, I, I guess the other observation I would make, James, is that the department is communicating to people like yourself, the white collar defense bar, to people like myself who may be focused more on the compliance side of things, that um, you really can uh, get the benefits of the new corporate enforcement policy and perhaps even beyond what the document itself says if you meet those four prongs, or at least three of them, of self-disclosure, extensive cooperation, and remediation as well. That's right. I agree with that. So next we had, um, you, you know, I, I, I used to think that, well, I'm not sure what I thought the case was that would never end, but this one just seems to <laughs> never end. And it's the case that keeps on giving, and it's even given this week, uh, which is not the subject of this podcast, but um, a, a, a large number of PETAVASA, uh related prosecutions. We had some uh, extraditions to the United States. Um, uh, so you want to bring us up to date, at least to the end of August, on where we were with, with PETAVASA? Yeah, sure. It, it's a it's a it's a very large case. I agree with you. It just keeps going and going. Um, it's been going on for about two years now, uh, at least publicly, with arrests and convictions. So we've got two strands um, it, of that. One is kind of the main strand, I would call it, which is uh, a number of business people and executives, officials from PDVSA and PDVSA um, subsidiaries who are alleged to have been in, engaged in a bribe scheme where the business executives would pay bribes to the officials to get a leg up in various contracts for supplies to PDVSA that, that typically involves a PDVSA subsidiary that um, gets supplies for PDVSA and, and things like that. So in August, um, DOJ announced the arrest of Jose Manuel Gonzalez Testino on charges of making corrupt payments to a PDVSA official in exchange for business opportunities, opportunities that included directing new contracts to his companies, being prioritized over other vendors for payments, and awarding PDVSA contracts to his companies in U.S. dollars instead of Venezuelan bolivares, which is a big deal if you're doing business in Venezuela. You want to be able to get that money out of there because of the inflation and the currency controls. Um, so this is kind of a, a another in that long line. Uh, it, it appears, I think, that the count in August was 17 individuals who have been charged in that line of cases, and 12 of whom have pleaded guilty already. Some of them are still outside the United States, but um, a very large, very successful, and by all accounts, ongoing investigation. The other one was a little bit different, but it, it's also – is starting to become a, a pretty big PDVSA related investigation of its own. In that one, it involves, again, um, slightly similar, but it involves an alleged currency exchange scheme that was used to embezzle approximately $1.2 billion, billion with a B, from PDVSA in about a six month time period from late 2014 to mid 2015. And that scheme allegedly used. Miami, Florida real estate uh, and sophisticated false investment schemes to conceal that that money had been embezzled from PDVSA. And there also appear to be some bribery allegations sprinkled in there as well. So uh, in August, a former managing director of a Swiss bank pleaded guilty to his participation in that billion dollar money laundering scheme. Um, and to just show the the uh, cross border nature of this, FINMA, which is the Swiss financial re regulator, is reportedly investigating the bank uh, where this person worked um, in connection with these allegations. Um, so we just see a lot of um, pedavesa related corruption. I think a lot of people knew it was out there um, in Venezuela and pedavesa in particular. Uh, and we're just seeing case after case being brought in connection with pedavesa related corruption schemes. And I know it's probably a big news for you at Houston because a lot of the uh, a lot of the alleged activities and people are either in Miami or Houston. 
Right. So we've been following it pretty close here. I, I was really interested in this second prong that you uh, articulated or identified, uh, James, which was the money laundering. That, that really brought a scheme that uh, I don't think many people have been aware of. The um, Julius Baer uh, banker uh, was sentenced to, uh, t- I think, 10 years, a, a pretty lengthy jail term for the money laundering. But there was one part of that case that I had not seen previously, and it involved an organization called the Homeland Security Investigations. Um, That's not a group I had seen be a part of uh, FCPA investigations, and I understand that this was not a a straight uh, FCPA case, but I was wondering if if you uh, could just give a few words about what Homeland Security Investigations is and how they would have worked with someone like yourself when you were back with the DOJ. Sure, sure. Yeah, and Homeland Security Investigations is actually the lead agency in the um, in the in the big case as well with the 17 individuals who've been charged. Um, so uh, everybody probably listening to this knows when it comes to FCPA enforcement on the DOJ side, all prosecutions have to come out of the fraud section in DC. Um, it's not the same for law enforcement agencies. There's no one law enforcement agency that has a monopoly on FCPA investigations. Um, several actually have overlapping jurisdictions. So it tended to be that our main law enforcement partners were the FBI. And that I think has probably increased since FBI created their uh, FCPA and anti-kleptocracy squads. Um, But we also often see, for example, IRS involved in FCPA cases because they have jurisdiction over money laundering cases. Uh, And you rarely see an FCPA case that does not involve money laundering. And then, you, of course, um, as you point out, uh, Homeland Security also has Homeland Security also has jurisdiction over FCPA cases as well. Um, when I was at the department, uh, I actually tried to expand that relationship with HSI um, because I thought that there was a lot of um, good that could be, frankly, done by competition <laughs> between agencies. I think if you've been involved in law enforcement, uh, you, you understand that sometimes competition can be a good thing and getting a getting a HSI in there might motivate FBI and vice versa. But also there's a, there's a natural overlap with Homeland securities because they have things like um, the Homeland security can do things like do border searches. Um, they're plugged into things that happen at, at airports, uh, you know, cross border, things like that. Uh, and they're really in many ways, a, just like FBI, a natural law enforcement partner. So there was a time there where we really did focus on trying to expand, and me in particular, um, expand that relationship with HSI. Uh, and I think that's continued, although I, I do believe, as I said, FBI has traditionally been the main law enforcement partner and they and with the kleptocracy and FCPA squads, that's probably they do still hold that primacy position. But uh, HSI is very well equipped to do uh, FCPA cases. So, James, I wanted to turn to the Hoskins decision, and that's an appellate decision uh, that came out uh, dealing with the prosecution of foreign individuals who work for foreign subsidiaries of U.S. companies outside of the United States. And I really didn't want to go into the legal part of the decision, but I really wanted to ask you sort of from your now role at uh, as a partner at Morrison and Forrester in the white collar defense has this case changed how you might consider either advising companies uh, to self-disclose or uh, anything else? Or is it just forces the prosecutors to use another avenue to charge individuals? Yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see what happens with Hoskins. Uh, the The biggest issue in my mind is the fact that although – the court ruled that you cannot have conspiracy or aiding and abetting liability for a person like Hoskins, who was neither a U.S. citizen nor employed by a, a U.S. company and did not step foot in the United States. Although you, the court said you can't use conspiracy or aiding and abetting to get them, you can still use an agency theory under the language of the FCPA. And so the court said that DOJ can go to trial on a theory that Hoskins was still an agent of Alstom, Connecticut, uh, for purposes of this FCPA violation. The, the problem is the court said, and I understand why it wasn't before them, but the court actually said that um, they declined to express any, quote, 
views on the scope of agency under the FCPA. <laughs> and so what I don't know is, is is there going to be a practical difference between alleging somebody conspired or aided and abetted an FCPA violation or was an agent of a company that committed an, uh, an FCPA violation. It may end up being that there's very little practical difference um, between those two theories, you know, maybe slightly different proof or slightly different language in the charging document, in which case there's no difference in the actual practical implications. On the other hand, maybe there's a huge difference and agency under the FCPA is going to be much more limited than uh, the theories that DOJ used to use. And so I think it's still very uncertain for companies and people on what this, what the practical implications of Hoskins will be from an FCPA standpoint. That said, if Hoskins did today what he allegedly did in this case back in the 2010 timeframe, it would most likely violate the UK Bribery Act um, as well as other anti-corruption laws. And so what it might mean is that while the US might not prosecute you, maybe another enforcement authority would. And especially when it comes to the UK, DOJ and, S, uh, DOJ and the SFO have a long history of dividing up cases and uh, dividing the share of work. So they could have decided early on, okay, you guys go get Hoskins and we'll get the rest. So I think that's a long way of saying, I don't think Hoskins should be um, a reason why companies or people should change the way they approach anti-corruption compliance. Um we don't know how far it's going to go. And even if there is a limit to U.S. jurisdiction, it's quite possible that you'll fall in the jurisdiction of another aggressive enforcement authority. And so the better thing to do is to to go about business as usual, um, have the right compliance policies in place, uh, and and take the right actions. You know, it's a great point. And uh, frankly, it's one I had not focused on on the international enforcement uh, efforts by multiple countries now. And uh, you're absolutely correct that uh, all the relationship between the Department of Justice and the Serious Fraud Office, and I can easily see a referral being made to the UK, France, Spain, Germany, obviously Brazil, or a plethora of other countries that would uh, be interested in taking a look at that very seriously. Right. So James, I'd like to end with uh, just a, a a few thoughts, perhaps, that you might have on the the one MDB scandal, and and I've been following this for a long time. I really don't want to go into kind of the the fraud or or how money may have been stolen from the uh, Malaysian sovereign wealth fund, but I'd like to focus more on U.S. companies who may have done business with the Malaysian sovereign wealth fund, or even in the with the prior regime in Malaysia. Uh, right now, probably the best analogy I can draw is to South Africa where um, the prior regime was generally uh, recognized as, uh, if not riddled with corruption, certainly prone to corruption. And the prior, and the prior Malaysian government uh, may uh, get that same uh, moniker as well. But um, if, a, if a U.S. company came to you, would, would you suggest they t- take a, a close look at who their third parties were in Malaysia, what the contract rates might have been, what the commission rates might be, or how they might even scrub their operations from an anti corruption, uh, anti-bribery perspective? I do think it's a good idea, Tom. Uh, one thing we know about 1MDB is that it's a lot of money um, that was allegedly stolen from the Sovereign Wealth Fund and used to invest in the Wolf of Wall Street, to buy super yachts, to, to do who knows what with it. So there's a lot of money out there. Um, and we also know that there's a lot of enforcement agencies that are working together on this investigation, obviously the United States, but also Singapore, Switzerland, Luxembourg, um, just a lot of enforcement authorities out there. So I think it is if if um, companies have done substantial business in that part of the world, uh, it's probably a good idea to to get ahead of this um, by looking into, it, like you said, third parties that were used, any unusual investments that may have been made, any red flags. Uh, it really might pay to try to get ahead of this one. Uh, 
So uh, I absolutely agree with that, uh, James. I've been visiting with James Kukios. He is a partner at Morrison and Forstner. We've been talking about the firm's uh, great monthly newsletter, Top 10 in- International Anti-Corruption Developments for August 2018. We're going to link to that in the show notes. And once again, James, uh, thanks for taking the time to visit with me. And I look, look forward to visiting with you on the uh, September newsletter. Always a pleasure, Tom. Thank you. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox again. I'd like to thank you for listening to this episode of the FCPA Compliance Report. If you have any questions, you can email me at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. We've linked to the Morrison and Forster August newsletter for the top international anti-corruption developments. So check it out. I hope you'll join me again next week where I have another episode of the FCPA Compliance Report. The FCPA Compliance Report is a part of the Compliance Podcast Network. 